I'm Joey Kneiser. Uh, I just made a movie called Mr. Presto. It's my first movie. Up to this point, I've been playing music and touring, and uh, mainly I've been a songwriter for most of my adult life. I've always been really into movies, and uh, actually movies were my first uh, love affair when I was a, a kid. Um, my dad had a huge movie collection, about maybe a thousand or two thousand VHS tapes, and I would watch them uh, all the time. So by the time I was in high school, I'd pretty much seen like every kind of important movie uh, up until that point. The way I got to music was actually from movies uh, in two different ways. One of those ways was that I realized that songs could be narrative and like little movies when I heard like a Rolling Stone and I heard um, Born to Run and I thought like, oh, this is like a little tiny movie. It was very, very cinematic. And the other one was when I was in sixth grade, I started skateboarding. I would watch skate videos all the time, and that's when I realized, like, oh, you can make movies. Like, these these are just kids making movies, Then they're not ever gonna show in a theater or anything, and they can do whatever they want. And so that was when I really decided that I would, you know, I wanted to do something with moving pictures. At the time, it seemed impossible, and when I went to college, I originally wanted to go to college to go to film school, but, um, my, my vision is like, a, if anybody knows about vision uh, or their prescription, my, pre my prescription is a minus 18, which is the, you know, by description of the United States government, I'm basically blind. And so, um, you know, an average person might be like a minus six or a minus four or something. Okay, my vision is minus 18. And so I've never driven a car. Uh, I, when I went, when I originally wanted to go to film school, and I moved to, uh, out here, I wanted to go to the Watkins Institute. But at that time, you, it was this was in the early '90s. It still was all uh, film, and so you had to have a 16 millimeter camera, and uh, we didn't have the kind of technology that we have now with like monitors that you can put real close to you and you can have focus peaking. And so I, I basically ha I had to wait until technology got to the point where I could actually do it, you know? The one thing about movies is it's not a young man's game like rock and roll is. Rock and roll is a young man's game. Like Robert Altman was making movies into his 80s, you know, like uh, John Huston, they were all making movies like way uh, well, I mean, uh, there is no age to cinema, which is one reason I love it so much, that you can be of any age and it, it's, it's, it doesn't really matter, you know. I, I, I basically decided, you know, most people, they hit, the, hit their midlife crisis and like buy, buy a motorcycle or something or they buy a sports car. And like, I've been wanting to make a movie my whole entire life and I've been wanting to just make movies my whole entire life. And so when I hit my midlife crisis, I bought a cinema camera. <laughs> and, and then once I had the camera, my wife was like, okay, you have the camera, you have to make the movie. And I was like, uh, all right, yeah, I'll make the movie. And so I, was, uh, I had to figure out how to make a movie uh, with no money and no actors. And so I kind of, came up with an idea um, for Mr. Presto, and then Shane, who plays Lowell, I would call him, because I knew, right, I was just looking at to see what we had access to. And so like, he, he has that 90, 1990s van, and I was like, okay, if we shoot your van, it's free, we don't have to have a location. Uh, we can always shoot driving or in parking lots or something like that. Uh, so that, let's build it around the van. It'll be an easy thing to be able to film. And then we'll just have you be in the van. And then the, my initial idea was to make it somehow about music. And I didn't want it to be, uh, you know, I thought it would be too on the nose if I just made a movie about music. And so I was just like, well, how can we make it about being a musician without, actually being 
you know, having musicians in it. And I was like, well, we'll just make it about a magician. Like who, who are the other, well, first I was like, who are the other people that live like musicians who make no money and they have to travel all the time? Like who would potentially live in their van? And we're like, we go, it could either be a comedian or it could be a magician. And then I was like, well, if we do a magician, then we could do all kinds of stupid stuff because it'd be like, he's a magician, right. you know? And so I was like, but we'll, it will still be a, a love letter to music because, um, you know, I thought like, what are the two, uh, what are the two pieces uh, of personalities to somebody who is a musician? And that is, there's the one side of you that is constantly uh, wanting to, to like live free and like be able to do your art and to be a kid all the time and to like have no responsibilities. And then there's the other part of you that is always, you know, trying to stop that part. That's like, you gotta grow up. You can't, you know, life is not about, you know, uh, following your dreams unless they pay off you know, big or something. And uh, it's that nagging voice. So I was like, well, I'm just going to make it two brothers. But they're really just, it's the two sides of what it's like to be an artist, basically. Mm -hmm. One's the straight laced person who complains all the time and doesn't want to try or do anything. And then the other one is lives completely free and does not care about anything, you know. Uh, and so that basically, it seemed very easy uh, to put something like that together because I had Shane already. And then Eric, who was, play, was a drummer for Glossary, he is also really into movies. And so the three of us were just like, well, just make a movie and uh, I'll make it about these two brothers. Um, and then I just went home and I spent a couple weeks, you know, writing, writing a story. And then when we went, we got, uh, knowing though that we would, you know, there was no way we'd be able to stick completely to it because we didn't, we didn't have any money or no locations. We'd have to change stuff. We'd have to rewrite on the spot. We'd have to, you know, so the movie, I would say is probably like 85% of the script. And then the rest of it is just maybe 80%. And then the rest of it is uh, having to change it on the fly, improv, improving and stuff, right. making a scene up like, oh, we should have a scene like this. And then we just would make it up on the spot, put it together. The whole reason we made the, this movie was literally to like three people who like was obsessed with movies their whole life to actually make a movie, which is such a colossal, just like join a club that like very rare few people get to say is that you like made a feature film, you know? Cause when I told people I made a film, they're like, oh, it's like 30 minutes. I'm like, no, it's like an hour and 50 minutes. Yeah. Like it's like a movie, you know? And uh, so it was, it was, Really, the movie was written like for the sole purpose of something that could be made. Like, you know, it wasn't like, oh, let's sit down and, and I'm gonna, we'll come up with the idea for a movie that we've always wanted to make. It was like, we got these things, how could we make a movie out of them? And then, and then in that little tiny constraint, like, like make the best idea up out of it, you know, that we could do with little to nothing, no money or, uh, you know, and no, no actors, little time, f all favors, like the movie, we, we might've spent like $4,000 on the movie right. and, and $3,500 of it was at one point the van, uh, that is the main character, like literally two months before the movie was finished, the transmission went out and we had to replace the transmission in it. So that, that's really where all the money went. <laughs> a lot of it was my friend, Andrew Kaffer, who lives in uh, uh, Portland, uh, right outside of Portland, did a bunch of it. Um, it was just like some of it, I actually mastered that record. And uh, uh, I was like, this stuff would fit. I tried, to, I tried to theme the characters. So like whenever, I wanted something kind of garagey and gritty, kind of like lo-fi for Lowell's music when he's on screen. Mm -hmm. And so his stuff worked very well for that. And then I, for like the Magic Man and for like a lot of the, like the uh, tent stuff, 
when I, when I was like a kid, like one of my favorite directors was John Carpenter and I was just like obsessed with John Carpenter. I was obsessed with like, especially like Big Trouble in Little China and like um, They Live, Escape from New York and stuff. So that's for all his stuff, I was like, I'm gonna just do synth, you know, 80 synth kind of like uh, sounds. And then for Willie's, uh, I did more of just like country bumpkin-y, Americana-y kind of like songs for whenever we see him in the, in the frame. And, and so my, my buddy, Luke Hard, I used his songs for that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, Shane, who is Lowell, he has two songs we ended up using in him uh, because they just fit really good, same kind of thing, that kind of indie garage-y. Uh, but yeah, I didn't want to make it. I was just like, I can't, I, there's no way I got enough time to do this. I mean, I did all the scoring part, all the um, the synth stuff throughout it, mm -hmm. and all the full, I mean, it, you know, like I said, it, it took me like six weeks to do the sound mix, uh, to, to add all the sounds and do the mix. I mean, I think I did like 5,000 Foley sounds. I mean, every sound in it is replaced. So like every time somebody walks, like moves, Every ambient sound in a room, I had to add all that kind of stuff, like every car sound, every, you know. So it, it took a long time. That took a long, long time. Because then it'd be like, oh, somebody's picking up a piece of paper, and I'd be like, ah, oh, gotta have a, I've gotta have the sound of somebody picking up a piece of paper. It's like somebody's walking through some leaves. I can't not put them walking through the leaves, you know? Yeah, that, that was a whole nother thing, because I, I don't think I, I don't think I realized how long that part of it was going to take. Even though I do audio all stuff all the time and mixing all the time, I, I don't think I had any idea how long it was going to take to do the audio. Just like I had labs on everybody and they were covered. Mm -hmm. And so there's Russell. And so I had to go in and take every piece of Russell out. I had to go in and EQ, I mean, a lot when it's on your chest, you know, it's very low, you know, picks up a lot of low end because it's, you know, it's really close to your chest and then it's also under your clothes, so it's like muffled. So I had to go in and like clean all of that stuff up. And then also like uh, the, these labs are on like a digital network. And so like anytime a, somebody has, you know, every now and then I get some interference from somebody's cell phone or something. Uh, so yeah, just having to clean all that stuff up too. That took a. That's what took the longest, because I had to clean up every, you know, every line. And then in EQ, it also like everybody's mic matched. Everything was the same level. Like, yeah, that was that was a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing I always wanted to have Eric and Shane. I was like, man, if you guys were only just flies on the wall the whole time I did the the post production. You'd have no idea, man. You'd have you guys have no idea because I like lived upstairs in that room. I mean, I I've, it took me a month to color grade it, and it was right when my son was born. So luckily, Jolene had three months off uh, of work, and so for one month of it, sh I was just in that room in the dark yeah. the first month because I was just like. We got, I gotta finish this. Because if we don't, if I don't get finished now, then it's not gonna be done. It's the last thing left to do. I, I'm definitely gonna do it again. I, I don't know if I wanna do it right away, right. but like, I definitely wanna do it again, you know? That's, it's, it's a weird thing, man. It's a, it's not really like anything else because like, it's, it's a, you have to play the long game with making a movie, you know, with a, cause it's like, that's the one thing about the next one is you it ha you have to go into something knowing that you you really w want to do it and that you're that you know it's something that you can see yourself doing for like the next year to year and a half you know it's it's basically like I mean it's it's in some ways kind of like you know uh, making a record because you know you go you make this record and then you you know you not spend a year writing the songs, and then you go you spend like a couple of weeks making the record, but you're committing yourself for the touring on it and playing the songs every night, you know. So I mean it's it's very much in that vein of of like 
so it's got to be something you like the next one like this one was uh, trying to be like a quirky kind of comedy and using my friends and kind of like paying homage to like all these kind of movies indie movies that we that I loved and like Misha and Eric loved but the next one I'd rather you know I want to try to take it up a notch and then try to make something that's like that you know we could maybe try to take to a couple of festivals or something you know Try, try to make everything about it, like production, the acting, the writing, and actually make, a, you know, less of a screwball thing and more of like, you know, something that has, that's more interesting, has something to say or something. Right. Because like I said, like I'll end up having to just work on it for a year and I don't want to just work on something all the time for something that I'm not 100% behind. Right. I mean, it make, it really makes you, I think, Shane and Eric, like I had studied film so much and how to make a movie, and when we started making the movie, I think they were blown away, and I think anybody who makes a movie, you're immediately blown away about how much you've been tricked your entire life to think something is happening that's not really happening, because a movie is unlike life, you know, life, there's a peripheral things going around you can turn your head you can see like a movie the only thing that's happening is what fits inside the little square so you know I, I remember when I was a kid and I watched like uh, some like behind the scenes things behind the scenes of, of Indiana Jones and I remember like like they were looking you know, some shot where they were looking through the uh, camera and then like then they cut and you see what they're actually filming and it's like oh outside of that frame there's like 40 dudes yeah. <laughs> there's a guy hanging in a bike and there's like there's like all of these people and like but I don't know that they've taken they have totally taken me at, like somewhere and and so you know when we first started the movie the first scene we filmed was the scene where they're in the van and they had just got into the altercation at the gas station. And so it's nighttime and they're driving the van at night on the way to the hotel. And I was like, we'll do that scene first. We'll try to, because we need to try to do something and see what, see um, if it's gonna work and stuff with you guys and figure out your characters and stuff. And then when they're like, well, how are we gonna do it? Like, are you gonna mount the camera? And I'm like, nah, I mean, we're not gonna mount the camera. I'm gonna put the camera on a tripod in my driveway and you're we're going to shoot you through the window it's going to be dark i'll be tied up on uh, uh, you know so just the front windshield is in it then we'll blast a blast moonlight uh come in from the side and then i'll have uh what looks like street lights and you know basically what i did is i had a camera on a tripod i had them talking I had my foot on the bumper of the truck and I had a tennis racket and I just bounced the truck and I waved that tennis racket back and forth over that light to make it go across their face periodically like they were moving. And then they were just doing that. And I had my friend, they came up, we did it. And then they came in and looked at it and they were like, oh my God. And I was like, yeah, wait, wait till I put like the sound of the car running and then cars driving by and nobody will ever know that that's how we did it. And then from that moment on, like you realize like, oh, this is what movie making is. Like it's constantly trying to like, like convince people that something's happening that's really not happening, you know? I mean, obviously in modern movies, you know, you go to those sets and, and like, you know, like a Marvel movie and it's just like in a giant, yeah, like green, green room. <laughs> it's all fake, you know, but, it, but just like simple things like that. And then, and once you like, you start understanding like the, the, the trickery that's going on when you watch movies, you can see it all the time now, like movies that you would never really, that you never thought about. You've watched a million times, you know, like, I remember we did, there's a couple things I had to do ADR on because the audio was messed up at the time and we had to go and replace the audio. And I was like, oh man, it, it, this it, ADR is just so hard to get sounding natural. Like, you know, you were recording it in this one space and now you're in a different space and you're trying to get it to match. And I remember one night after I was doing it, I was like, my wife went to bed and uh, turn, I was like watching TV with the he headphones on and I watched, uh, the Temple of Doom came on and I was like, oh my God, half of this movie is ADR. I never noticed it. It all sounds like it was recorded in a studio. Yeah. Like, so weird.
Like you just never realize stuff like that. Yeah, you're That's what good storytelling is. It's like you're watching a movie and even people who make movies and know how they work, like, that's it's it's the same it's the same with any kind of art it's the same when like you're listening to a record it's like the only things that you should not do in any art form are the things that take somebody out of being in what they're experiencing so like you know like if you're listening to a record and there's like just really bad some crazy like you know like one to three k range just ear spiking and you just cannot you know it's just you know hurting your ears, like you're never gonna be able to get into it. Or if the, somebody is just way out of tune, or if the, te if the tempo of the song is just all over the place, and it, you, you constantly, you're like, oh, I'm listening to human beings playing music, as opposed to something bigger as what you want it, it to happen. It's the same way when you're watching a movie, it's like, you know, or same way when you're reading something, you don't wanna read something, and there's just so many typos and grammatical mistakes that you're constantly reminded that you're reading. You know, you want to use the other part of your brain uh, that takes you somewhere else. And so that's like the that's like the one thing that I was trying to do the most with making the movie is try to do stuff that doesn't take you out of it. But it's like so impossible to do, like especially when you've never done stuff before like that. And, and also it's like you're doing it so fast, so quick and with no you know, no team, <laughs> no gaffers, no grips, no first ACs, no nothing. <laughs> like there's just me and then uh, like musician friends acting. Yeah. yeah, and there's no rehearsal either. So it's like, you know, I'd have the audio, I'd have the audio gear on me. I'd have to lav everybody up, hide it, have the audio gear on me, then get the camera. And then, you know, I'd have all my lights and I'd have to set up the lights. And then like, you know, most of the time I had all that stuff on me and then I'd have to be like moving a light. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a lot. You know, I've watched, I know all the references, you know, it's like producing, it's like I've studied records and listened to everything and had a, had a phase with everything you can possibly dream of, you know? Same with movies, I've watched, I mean, I've gone through, you know, I'm, like, I'm a cinephile, so I've just watched every everything, you know? Like, I, wa I watch sometimes two, if not three movies a day a lot of times, like, yeah. Cause I well, I'm watching a kid a lot, and so I can't really do anything. So I'm usually always watching a movie in the morning when I first wake up, and then, you know, and then me and uh, then I'll watch like if I, well, if I'm watching him, I'll I'll try. I might be able to squeeze another one, but I'll usually always watch one at night. And so you know, I'll just pick. I what I would do forever is I would pick like a, a director or a genre. I'd be like. This is French New Wave month, you know? <laughs> and I just go through them, <laughs> you know? I'd be like, Kurosawa week, you know? So many of th those things that I stole that are in Presto that like are so many cinephile type of things. Like I would be watching something and like, you know, I'm, and there's a scene in Mr. Presto where we had the last day of shooting. It was impossible for me to get Mike, who played the magic man, and to get John Latham, who played Willie, in the same place at one time, because they both had, I mean, this is why I won't ever have a movie with musicians in it again, because it's like musicians play shows and tour all the time. So uh, we had him there, and then at the last minute, Mike couldn't do it, but it, I already had, John Latham in the car headed down to Murfreesboro and I was like, well, look, we're going to figure this out no matter what. We're just, that's it. They're like, well, how can we have the scene where the magic man kills Willie if the magic man's not there? And I was like, I had just watched uh, Brian De Palma's Sisters like the day before and I was like, there's a scene in it, Sisters, where they like, they uh, murder happens and, it, and it's all silhouetted on the wall. And I was like, I'm just, we're just gonna silhouette, You're go we have his clothes here, you put his clothes on, I'll silhouette you on the wall, and we'll have just this silhouette kill him, and it'll be like super uber dramatic, and you know, that's just how, this is how we have to do it, you know? This is a, the limitations we gotta deal with, and that's how we did it, and then like, you know, my wife was like, had the sriracha bottle, was going like this, on the wall. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was, it's probably turned out cooler than how we originally were gonna do it, where it was just gonna be like this conversation -y kind of thing, you know? Uh, it made it a little bit more artsy. Like I said, the, the thing about it, making a movie was, to me, was it was doing something so 
like I'm at the point in my life where I want to do things that seem so colossal, but but basically like, you know, I can desensitize them to myself somehow. Like I used to think like forever I wanted to make a movie. I wanted to make a movie and I was just like, how do you do that? I mean, how can just, you, it seems so insane to make a movie. But, but it's like, if we just do it and try to do it and stick with it, then we've done it. Then any other art project we try to do from this point on, it's gonna seem so small, you know? Cause right after it, I went and recorded and produced a record and I was just like, oh man, I can do this in like two months. I just spent like a, a like every day for a year doing this one thing and it was, and you know, it was crazy. Shit! Hot! Some people say I'm a 